All across America, Sundays in the fall are synonymous with family and football. In the town of West Hartford, this pastime has a home, Sterling Field. Today, the Sersosimo McKee family comes to watch five-year-old Brady play flag football. While not far away, the Robinson family watches 10-year-old Jonathan compete in the Pee Wee division. For these two families, football is a way of life. And in 2013, this story begins again, right back where it started nearly 60 years ago, when Bob McKee and Frank Robinson first coached against each other in the inaugural Hall Connard football game right here at Sterling Field. So the Robinsons and the Sosasmos have been coaching football in West Hartford for a long time. And the fact that Matt is now coaching at Connard is no surprise to me. There's not enough words to describe the feelings that I have when I think about you know, what is actually taking place and being the third, you know, generation, the third McKee slash Sosimo coach to come into play. All I ever wanted to do is to see him come back and be on the staff with his father. I think having those families and having the ties between the coaching staffs is what makes the rivalry so special. You know, I remember Coach Robinson saying, okay, man, you're the leader. Let's, let's, let's do your job to the best of your ability. And, and he was very positive with me, and he, he showed me how to be a leader. Um, and then to be shifted over to Connor made me even better to be with Coach McKee. That's, I, I, I mean, I can't even express how I feel about that. This is what they were made to do. Rob taking over for Coach McKee and Frank taking over for his father, that their heart and soul and, and very essence of being in, is in the program. It's almost like we're just, you know, two big families, uh, the Hatfields and McCoys, if you will, that get together once a year and we support each other uh, on every game all season, but we want to win this one. This is the story of two families who have championed a rivalry, helped boys become men, and taught a town how to compete. The Conard Hall rivalry is, is, is unparalleled. When the kickoff occurred, it was Katie bar the door. It's a throw out the record book, tape your knuckles kind of game. It's pride. We didn't like them and they didn't like us. It didn't take me long to realize the one team I wasn't supposed to like and I didn't like was that team across town. You either bled Conard red or Hall high blue. We don't want to hurt them. We don't want to be real malicious about it, but we just want to beat them. It was a routine at basketball games to chant the score of the football game that year if you were the winner. We're combatants for that one day and afterwards we'll always be connected at the hip because of that game. This experience that we share, there's nothing better. You don't forget a play, it is scary. We were beaten by Conard and to this day it bothers me. Nothing breeds contempt like familiarity. So to me, Hall Connor games are a lot like fist fighting your own brother. I want Connor to win every football game they play, except the game against us. I never root against them. Why would I? They're my friends. It's family. You know, it's, uh, you know I probably like the Connor football family better than my own family. I don't have any strong uh, dislikes or I don't have a hate feeling towards Hall because they're Hall. I was a coach at Hall for nine years and that's where I got my start. There's certainly love between the two of you. I mean, it's, it's generally people you've known most of your life. It's people you've been on youth league teams with. It's people who have been your teammates and now you're, in, you're stuck in this bitter rivalry against them. You know, you wanted nothing more than to show you know, that you were the best team in town. And that was, was very important. But at the same time, it was a lot of fun because you ended up playing against some of your, your friends that you've known for a long time. It was pride that was gonna last for a lifetime. Either you are gonna be able to brag about it and enjoy the fact that you won that game your senior year, or you're gonna have to live the rest of your life knowing that you lost that Conard Hall game. You're hanging with your Conard boys and you see some of the Hall boys, you know, and you get older and you, you, you know, and you let the old rivalries lay by the wayside and, and you're like, yeah, didn't you take a swipe at my uh, Adam's apple? You know, it's, oh yeah, that old trick, you know. <laughs> Told Rob this many, many times for 364 days and 22 hours, we are the best of friends. For two hours, I 
on a Saturday afternoon, or now a Friday night, we're going to go at it. People try to say, well, just try to keep it a regular game. It's not a regular game. It's the Hawk game against your rival. It's like Ohio State playing Michigan. It's, you know, it's, 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 it's UCLA, USC. It's a team that we play that is our arch rival. To understand what happened with the start of the hall Connor rivalry, you need to look at the fact that when Connor opened in 1957, they were very uh, wise in the town of West Hartford, and they said, if you can walk to school, you're going to go to Hall. If you have to get on a bus, you're going to Connor. So that made Connor three and a half times the size of Hall. And everybody kind of figured right from the start, well, you know, Connor's just going to dominate everything. Connor opened up in the fall of 1957, and Frank Robinson came in from Rye, New York, to coach Paul. And Coach Bob McKee went to Connor to new school. We had always kept in touch, and uh, I thought to myself, "Gee, if I have a good friend on the other side, it won't be so bad to take a loss from him." And he had an undefeated season there. He had such credentials. I'm not so sure it was a good move on my part. And as Coach Robinson has told me the story several different times, his first day of practice, he had about 13 players there of back of the old Hall High School, which is now the town hall. And he even told me that the superintendent and principal looked out the window at the first day of practice and came out and told him that, uh, they said, Frank, we knew the cupboard would be bare a little bit here. We, we realized that most kids were gonna go to Connor, but we didn't think it was gonna be like this. And if you want, we'll let you out of your contract. You can go back to New York. We just talked to them this morning. They're still looking for somebody. And Frank said, no, that's, that's fine. I, I made a commitment here, and let me, let me stick it out, and let's see how it, how it goes. Initially, especially in the summertime, uh, the turnout was not large for football at Hall High the first year, and I sort of was a little concerned about uh, Coach Robinson comparing White Plains football, uh, which was a very large program there, to the new Hall High program. Everyone was sharp and went to Connor, unless you were close enough to walk the hall. And we're in the center of town, so there wasn't too many people. <laughs> we had very few. It was tough, and we didn't have that many kids turning out for football. I mean, there were practices where we were going half on half, um, but Robinson pulled it through. I think everyone uh, in, in that senior class had good friends who wound up going to the other school. I knew that uh, I wouldn't be playing my last year with the kids that I played with at uh, Hall. So that was the emotion. We had just won the first championship in the league, CCIL, with my last year at Hall. And I said what, to myself, oh, to have a new champ with uh, new facilities and all and starting to write a new scorecard. It was a, a good group of kids, but uh, they uh, all adjusted to our limitations. Whereas kind of the new school boy, they had all kind of facilities. Every time we turned around on a little practice field, we hit somebody. That's why I used to say we were so tough. And it was interesting because when Conard was getting on the map, all of a sudden, Conard went to Herb's Sport Shop, which was in the center, and they had jackets. And so my brother and the other co-captain said, we got to have jackets. They had never had team jackets before. And I think many of us at Hall felt we not only had lost friends in the student body, but we lost our coaches. We lost, we lost our, many of our favorite teachers. Uh, and we really, uh, I think in that senior year, many of us felt, okay, we, we kind of picked up the pieces. I think that first month, that first six weeks, um, there was a lot of uh, what kind, what's our identity going to be? And in that sense, the sports really did help. The rivalry was building because it was brand new and it for the older guys, like my brother, older. <laughs> For those guys, it was kind of like weird because now they're going to play against their best friends. Believe it or not, that first game that we played was, was hard because I was playing against guys that I played with for a couple of years. So that was the, the hard part. It was emotional and you tried to make it a rivalry, but 
in reality, it was hard to play against the guys, you know, that you had played with. The first year they played, um, Connor really had the bulk of the players from the 56 championship team. And as I said, um, Coach Robinson and Hall had those 13 kids, and I think a few more kids joined the team during the course of the season, but they didn't have a whole lot of kids. And they went over there really undermanned, and Connor won the first game 7-6. And my father used to tell uh, Frank Robinson all the time that, you know, Frank, I know you won a lot of championships and I know you won a lot of games over the years, but I think that first Hall Connor game was your greatest moment as a coach because you had a really outman team and you only lost by 7-6. And many people said you, easy, you could have won the game. And Frank used to tell my dad, you know something, Bill? I think you might be right about that. That was a great game with a great group of kids. We barely won that first game, and that was, I think, really the way it should have been. I'm glad I won against Hall, but it was very emotional, and we won 7-6, to six, so that was, should have been the way it should have been. We probably should have tied. And everybody knew from that moment on that things had changed, that there was going to be a rivalry in, in West Hartford. And so much of that is owed directly to Frank's coaching ability, but also I think you have to understand what Bob McKee brought to that first year as well, because the two men together established a rivalry and also established a friendship. That also was a, changed my direction as far as Hall and Frank Robinson, and that, that was the one game of the year. If we lost them all but won that one, my day would be made. I think we all felt, well, it's going to become a Thanksgiving Day fixture. It would have made sense. Bob didn't want it because he wanted Thanksgiving to be a family day. In retrospect, having the Hall Connor game played on the Saturday ahead of Thanksgiving turned out to be an absolute blessing because it was a standalone high school game. And it was the game that everybody, coaches, uh, you know, the whole high school football fan public came to see. Football is like life. You have the bitter and the sweet, and when it's victorious, it's heaven on earth. At the start of each season, we used to get a letter from Coach McKee. He basically told us that we were going to do the ordinary extraordinarily well. Coach McKee is extremely disciplined, and he taught me how to discipline myself. And he taught me that discipline was a really important part of what you do in your life. He cared. He was tough. At times he was mean. He was just somebody that I looked up to. I used to kid Bob McKee uh, that he could actually have coached a football team without a football. They could have used a cloth or they could have used a towel because they didn't throw it. Uh, they just ran it down your throat. And if you couldn't stop it, well, that was too bad. I just hard nose football. I'd rather run the power eye until I, they drop. He had the same play numbers and the same cadence years into, into his coaching. I learned them uh, when I was uh, one of his managers as a student at Hall. And I still knew all the plays when I was standing on the sidelines covering games in the 70s. Nothing changed. I, I really never took over for Coach McKee because um, I could never fill his shoes taught the rules of life through football. The day my father died, um, I came to Conard. Uh, it was after I had graduated. Coach McKee dismissed his classes and spent the rest of the day with me. It was, uh, he was the person I wanted to see. I love the man. To this very day, I love the man. So I feel very fortunate. I've had one wife, one job my whole life. Johnny Zumzik was the kind of player who, if you were a head coach coming into a new job and you could ask for one gift, it would be John Zumzik. Phenomenal, phenomenal player, phenomenal athlete. I was on the sideline one time watching him run a play, and I was just enthralled. He had great speed. He had terrific uh, vision. 
he had a competitive edge that you really had to know him well to know how competitive he was because he was quiet but he wanted to beat you worse than just about anybody I ever knew. We would build our plays around him. There were a lot of option plays where he could either run, throw, but he was uh, that good that they would automatically try and stop him. And his arrival as a truly outstanding player made it possible for, for Frank to put in uh, a pretty explosive offense. Uh, if you could get the ball to Johnny, one-on-one -on -one against the defender, uh, you were in trouble <laughs> as a defense. And if he got past you, nobody caught him. The 1958 game is quite memorable to me. I scored four touchdowns. One of the touchdowns was an interception by me of a sideline flare pass by Bill Cherist, I believe, the quarterback from Conard. I tapped the ball up in the air and then grabbed it and ran in for a touchdown. I had two long touchdown scores. One of them was, I believe, a punt return of about 60 yards, and the other one was a run from scrimmage uh, for about 60 or 70 yards. And also, we were leading by a lot, but uh, they came back and the score was very close, 30 to 28 with about two or three minutes to go. All Coach Robinson said, we don't want to fumble the ball, so keep giving it to me on a dive. We, we ran out the clock and uh, Connor, uh, the score was 30 to 28. If Connor got the ball again, who knows, they might have scored, but they never got a chance to get the ball. We often hear people will say, well, he, he won that game by himself. Doesn't happen in football very often, but it did happen that day. He was going like crazy. He was just running through people and, and uh, they were trying to stop him and we were all blocking for him. He was a very good player, excellent. Bob McKee always did a great job of preparing to play Hall. He couldn't contain John. No one could. You know, you look back at Joe Namath's Super Bowl and everybody says that's what made the Super Bowl. John Zumzik's victory for Hall over Conard made that rivalry. We were no longer the little child of Conard and Conard was the big school and Hall High was the smaller school in uh, West Hartford. We were on par uh, with Conard. That game proved to Hall Hall could be on the block with the much bigger school, and it didn't matter that it was another 10 years before the new hall was built and the two schools actually got to be fairly similar in size. The reason that this rivalry is such a great rivalry, I believe, is because of the people involved. And it really starts with the head coaches when the schools first started in 1957. Coach Bob McKee at Conard and Coach Frank Robinson at Hall. Yes, they were rivals, but they, they were educators first, they were friends, and they always had mutual respect for, for your opponent. Well, mine was more of a, a hard-nosed kind of thing, maybe because I wasn't as bright as Frank Robinson, and he'd come in with all these uh, unbalanced lines and wide out flankers and all to test your ability to adjust your defense to his uh, offensive maneuvers. So it was always a, a healthy contest when, when we got together. Bob doesn't get probably the, the respect that he deserves as a baseball coach. Bob McKee was a great baseball coach. Just the fact that the state of Connecticut has high-level high school wrestling is because Frank Robinson brought it from White Plains, New York, and put it into our gym class in his first year at Hall and said, we're going to have a varsity team. We didn't have anybody to compete against, but we did have a varsity team. I enjoy the very beginning of the season when we're all by ourselves on the playing fields. No other teams have started in the end of the year when we're all by ourselves. The seniors last week, so everyone's pushing for everything they got left. Everyone feels like this is it. This is the one we have to win. That's all I knew. That's all I ever heard about was the Hall game, the Hall game. And you know, Harvard, Yale have their version of the game. And this town looks at that game as the game. Whether I was strapped to the top of the bleachers my first year as a six month old, you know, even playing in it, it's just been ingrained in, in my entire family's life. It's special, it's special. This varsity team that we have here is, has had a great three games. You have the uh, playoff implications game in 2011, you have the first ever overtime game last year, and you have the first ever Hall Conard uh, night game this year. 
I'm so excited for it already. We're just so into it, so focused. Sweating bullets, matter of fact. We're just going all out because we really want this win. And especially us seniors, it's our last year, and we want to finish it nice. Four uncles, a couple cousins had gone through the Conard football program. And that Saturday afternoon game when families gathered, that to me was all I knew. I've thought about my senior year Hall Conner football game since I started playing football. In it. It's important. It's very important. And you know, it's the last game of the year. And if you're not going to the playoffs, it's how you end your season. Just being part of it my whole life, I know that all your buddies are on the other side of town. It's guys you know. You're winning it not just for your team, you're winning it for all of the Hall football players or all of the counter players. It's something that's bigger than any of us. For the Conard staff, Hall Conard Week begins at the home of head coach Rob Sersosimo, much as it has for the past 30 years. And while the addition of his son Matt to the staff was surprising, perhaps it was also inevitable. Leaving UConn, initially the, the general public or someone that I would know or someone that was following closely along would say, wait a minute, you're, you're leaving a BCS program, you're leaving a Division I program to go teach PE and coach high school football? Are you out of your mind? When Matt called me in, uh, I'll say, March, he goes, Dad, uh, what do you think about me uh, teaching in West Hartford? And I'm like, what? Because I mean, here he is at UConn, and we all think it's such a glorious job to be a football coach at the college level. But those of us that really know how it works, those guys, they never stop. They probably work 18 hours a day. It was a big decision for Matt and I, um, but really for Matt, he's always wanted to come back um, to give back to his community, back to the high school. He has very fond memories of Conard. I said, well, listen, Matt, I go, there's no openings in West Hartford. I said, but if you really, I really want this opportunity, I said, the best thing for you to do is to come to West Hartford, go through the application process, and prove you're, you're ready and able to take a position. Um, coaching in college is not a glamorous thing. It really is not, especially if you have a, a young family. And more times than not, my wife it was by herself with the three kids because I was out recruiting or I was uh, in the office till 11 o'clock at night. When they said that uh, he would be the number one person to be hired, I came home to Debbie and I said, Debbie, um, I said, I'm gonna retire. And Debbie was like, what? And I said, yeah, I said, I said, Matt really wants a job. And I said, this is the best thing for our family. All I ever wanted to do is to see him come back and be on the staff with his father. So now there'd be three generations of us coaching at the high school. They're trying to cloud that area. So I called it four cloud. And then the roll, the roll means they're rolling their coverage over to the three receiver side. Watch their safeties go on the snap of the ball. For varsity players, the quarterback is not particularly mobile, but he's a big kid and he's fairly athletic. This is how they make their living. I just told you, getting off blocks, knocking you back into the hole, and then finding the ball. You gotta do a great job with it. I was extremely intense about making sure that they understood that they have the ability to do whatever they want to do and whatever they want to accomplish if they put their mind to it. Yeah, yeah just don't second get yourself. Just go hit the hole as hard as you can, okay? We're too good to second get yourself. We're playing to the best of ability. We're fighting hard and we never give up. And it's hard, it's hard. You know, coming off a loss, like a three game losing streak, but you know, we just don't stop. We just keep on working harder and harder. We have the lead at halftime. We have the lead. We're always winning until the fourth quarter, and we just seem to let it slip away. So um, the last couple of weeks, we've had this motto, drive for five, which we've really focused on intensifying our practices. It's been a challenging season, but we feel like we're, we're taking steps in the right direction. We feel like we're getting better every week. And right now, we're driving for five wins and to hopefully carry on a legacy that we're leaving as seniors. Should have had a better record, but I mean, it's not much you can do to change it now. You just got to keep drive for five, beat Hall.
then the season salvage if you be hard enough. You know, going into the season, our run game, uh, I was never very concerned with the run game because Connor had always been a a proficient run offense. But in the back of my mind, I always thought about, from a pass game standpoint, how quickly and how well they would pick things up. We can throw the ball or we can run the ball with equal preciseness, and that's the thing that's really exciting about it. Read it, read it, read it. When I was involved with this offense, when Joe Moore had brought it to UConn, um, it was a learning process for us then. And there were flashes of brilliance in the offense, but then there were also inconsistencies that held us down. And it wasn't until the next year that we got the thing really rolling, and that was the year that we went to the Fiesta Bowl. Well, we're very excited about how well we're functioning as a group, and uh, we're doing some things very well. Uh, we're moving to the ball well, which I'm really happy about. Our tackling is better. Um, we were playing with a little more uh, excitement. When you guys are going right now, come up here. Okay, it is here, it is here. Punch right in here, lean, lean. So if we beat Hall, you know, that's kind of, that's kind of success in my eyes, you know. But um, this year, them being uh, ranked in the state, you know, kind of ups the ante a little bit. When you give of yourself completely, unselfishly, then everybody around you and you get so much more out of it. And that's what we try to sell at Conard. It's not about me or I, it's about us and we. Caleb, break us down, Caleb. Chief is on three! One, two, three, three, two! Black jerseys in the box! Getting two lines! Well, our football program this year is, is very fortunate because we have great seniors. Coach, do you want a missile? They can do whatever they want. I got it, we got it. He might delete you like you want. Oh! I remember I was always one of the biggest kids in elementary school, and so all the kids were like, you need to come out and play football, and so I did, and I fell in love. I have two older brothers, and both of them were captains, along with myself, and I think us three being captains really made my dad and my mom very happy. Yes. It's kind of like a way to relieve stress for me. Uh, we go through long days of school, and then we come out here, we get to hang out with our friends, but we also get to work hard and uh, get in shape and then just kind of be on, be on kids a little bit, so it's fun. That was a really good call. Even before I was up running with the football, you know, I had uncles who just all the time reminisce talk about great plays and just the amazing life that it's given them and their confidence and how the commitment just turns you into more of a man. So if you hear Buffalo, you hear left and I'm on the left, just gonna get closer to Tom, catch, close step, boom, catch it, follow the tackle. Let's do it right now. All right, right come on. One of the easiest years offensively we've had because we're so, we have that skill, we have that experience. It's really been, it's been fun, really. You know, they're just a pleasure to coach. They're really good kids. They work hard. They did all the work in the off season that they knew they had to do. And it got us to the point where we are now. Jam ball to the flat. Oh, look what I saw. And then you, you're going to go to Jamie Canyon and kind of back up a little bit. All right. All right. Try to get the slant. Right. Coach Robinson does a great job with every kid making him feel welcome right from day one. And then uh, once you get older and you've been with the coaches for a while, just the relationships you have there um, it makes practice fun. It makes games even more fun. And, uh, it's almost emotional thinking that it's over, but it's a beautiful thing to be able to come so far with people you're so close to. This whole team can be one of the better teams we've had. It's got a lot of talent um, and a lot of playmakers, probably some of the best playmakers we've had uh, in the 20 some odd years that I've been in the program or around the program. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Just will this win, and then it's done. We don't have to worry about anything Go. else. Right? We don't have to worry about anything else. We just said, I want this more than they do. This is important for me. I want to make the freaking states. I want to win the conference. I put a lot of work in, too, so I'm going to be selfish now. I want you guys to be selfish now, too. Yes, sir. Time to be selfish. Win this freaking game. Let's go. 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 Bring it up. Bring it up. Bring it up. Let's go, loud and proud, boys, loud and proud. Warriors on three, Warriors on three. One, two, three. Warriors! Let's go, boys. Woo!
When we were kids, we used to trade baseball cards all the time. And Rob, we were really young, happened to come into this, you know, group of people. And he comes in and says, Steve, what's going on? And I'm like, hey, I'm getting seven cards for Mickey Mano. And he's, he whacks me. He says, no, you're not. You're not giving up Mickey Mantle for seven guys. I said, Rob, yeah, I am. I'm getting seven guys. He hits me again. He says, Steve, remember this. It's been a good lesson. He says, you never trade quality for quantity. And in the eighth grade, I met Rob Sersosimo, and he was a Northwest kid uh, or a Catholic school. We talked him into coming to Hall. And to us, it was like a coup. Uh, that, that started a friendship we had all through high school. He knew in high school what he wanted to do with his life. He wanted to coach high school football. He knew that then. His whole life, I think, changed because he came to Hall and was under Robbie and wanted to be a football coach. And uh, the way it turned out, uh, we'll, we'll take all the credit for that. <laughs> they said, today we're going to have challenge drills. And Jim's going to go up challenge against this other individual. And I went, fine. Rob Sosasimo comes up to me and he says, you got to win this. I go, yeah, yeah, yeah. He goes, no. He grabs me by the collar and he pulls me and he goes, you don't understand. You got to win this today or you're not coming with us tomorrow. Everybody on the team is screaming for the other guy. He was a very popular kid and whatnot. And Rob pushed through the crowd and he came like this far away from Turby, you got to do this. And he coaxed me on and help me. And as a young youngster to be able to do that, it rubbed off on me right then and there. And I won the challenge drill. And I became a member of the Hall High Warriors. And uh, Rob helped me do that. There was a certain pride that you had at the old hall that was different than any other place I've ever been at. So for me to grow up in that kind of a situation and, and, and you know be a hall, old hall player, um, I think that probably the only reason that I was selected as, as a leader in the school is because they probably ran out of leaders and they didn't have anybody else to take the place of it. You know what I mean? So they just said, well, Sass will be the leader. Let Sass be the leader. And, uh, you know, I remember Coach Robinson saying, okay, man, you're the leader. Let's, let's, let's do your job to the best of your ability. And, and he was very positive with me and he, he showed me how to be a leader. We used to stop by his house. He'd be up in the attic. You'd have to climb up this ladder to get up in the attic. This is August. It's 90 degrees out. He's up in the attic with a rubber suit on, lifting weights, all right? Get it? That's what he would be doing. And that's why he was the captain. The one game before the Hall Connor game was down in Muzzy Field against Bristol Central, I believe. And Poor Rob, he had one of those games where somebody has a bad day. And Rob had a bad day that day. He couldn't uh, catch anything. And we blamed him, we teased him, and he was, he was a good egg. Uh, but uh, you just you had to feel for the guy having a bad day like that. Going into uh, that week, the Hartford Times and the Hartford Current, anything in the paper is all about the upcoming massacre that's going to happen. I even talked to a couple of fellows from Conard the night before the game, and they literally laughed in my face. So it kind of builds up to nothing else matters except the hall Connor game. Uh, and that's kind of what happened that year. I distinctly remember getting up, pacing around the dining room table and whatnot. My father says, are you nervous? And I went, yeah, which I never would have admitted that to him. And but in that particular day, I was. I, I couldn't sit down. It was just, I was overcome by it. And I said, you know what? I'm going to walk down the hall high. By the time I hit the end of my driveway, Rob Sosasimo was driving up Ridgewood Road, <laughs> coming by my house. And he, boom, he pulls up in front of the, uh, you know, boom, Rob Sosasimo. <laughs> and uh, I get in the car, and, uh, you know, he's just more nervous than me. We drove around for a little while, and then we went down the hall high and prepared for the game. The second or third play of the game, Jeff Maxwell gets the football and he goes the whole length of the team down and he scores. It's six to nothing. Boom, they hit the kick, seven to nothing. It's like right from the start. It's like, you know, this is not the way we thought it was going to be. So now, over on the counter side, they're all figuring, here we go. This is going to be a cakewalk. 
after the game before where Robert had such a miserable game and coming in and maybe getting down early, uh, all of a sudden uh, we, Rob Sussosmo made a catch and uh, it was like you euphoria and that way, yo, we got a shot here. And I, I can remember being at Connor and I can remember, I can actually visualize if I shut my eyes, I can visualize watching the ball come down and it's spinning as it's coming down and watching the laces spin and uh, watching it into my hands and then catching it and then, you know, f falling back into the end zone, I guess, and, uh, and it being lucky enough to, to score the touchdown. If you had seen him the week before, you wouldn't think he'd ever catch another ball. And uh, it kind of redeemed everything that we felt and knew about him. The hall side goes wild. We go, line up, we want to kick for the, uh, the extra point. It's blocked. Yikes. It starts raining like there's no tomorrow. And be because of the score, seven to six, no one left. In comes his play that Frank Robinson had designed. And uh, they call, uh, I get in the huddle, and Barney Kelleher, he's the quarterback, that's what we called him, Barney, and he goes, this is it, Turb. I'm supposed to dilly-dally as a, a, a right end, and one, two, and on three seconds, the all-state type track star that I was, at three seconds, explode and run as fast as I could. And when I did that, the back, thinking it was a, a, a sweep because the, uh, everybody's going for the triple option, he started following the, uh, the flow of the triple option. As soon as he did that, I knew right away, we're gonna win this game. I get out there and I'm running full speed, I'm crossing the 50, here comes the ball. It just seemed like it came out of nowhere, you know? And I knew right away, good God almighty, don't drop it. <laughs> and I caught the ball, it was just, it just fell into my hands and I grabbed it, and there was no way I was letting go of that. No way. And I ran all the way down, the rest is history. And we won the game. It was just exhilarating, you know. It, it, make, it makes your whole senior year and made your whole career in football worthwhile just winning that one game. All of a sudden, onto the bus comes Mr. Sasasimo. Big cigar, he gets on, and he gets on, and he goes, listen to me. I'll never forget this to the day I die. He says, that was the most fantastic football game I ever saw in my life. And to show how much I appreciate it, I'm taking the whole football team out to dinner. It was the easiest loss to take because I had so much admiration for him. He walked in the door right now and said to me, hey, Rob, go run through that door. I'd run through the door because that's how much affection I have for him. Frank Robinson was a great psychologist. And I remember him having his football team gather in the gym like four or five hours before a game and just concentrate on preparing for the game. I guess we'd call it visualization today. I don't think there was a name for it then. Oh yeah, that's the game in your hand. As we always said, the ball doesn't weigh very much. My poor old mother could do it, could carry it. So, but it's holding on the ball, securing it. Here we are, maybe the smallest school in the state at that point, playing, you know, top level. And he introduces two platoon football. Well, I think the more players you got in, uh, the better atmosphere you had. When they didn't go two platoon, uh, would get discouraged and leave. And then later on, all of a sudden, they would really explode. It would be something gr really good. But if they're not around, they can't do it. Every practice, make sure you call the kid's name, say their name. Make sure you, you give them a pat on the back. And then third, say something positive about that person. The whole idea that, hey, the coach doesn't know me, he just yells at me. They got to know that uh, they're important and we know them. That he noticed you and paid you a compliment uh, just meant an awful lot to everybody and I think had a lot to do with us having 160 and 70 pound linemen and uh, overachieving. He always loved to have shop teachers as his assistant coaches. If I said you're supposed to be an inch off the left shoulder of the man you're facing, I didn't mean an inch and a half and, sh and shop teachers understood that. 
always been amazingly positive, making people believe that they could, as opposed to why they couldn't. In the 60s, there weren't any female athletes. There was no basketball team. They didn't have basketball team. They would have intramurals, and they would play one another, and that would be it. Some girls came in, and they said, we want to uh, start a, a, a volleyball team. And <clears throat> he said, I think that's a great idea. Let's do it. I mean, right on the spot, he says that. I'm thinking, jeez, <clears throat> he was never that agreeable with us. <laughs> And the next thing you know, volleyball's happening at a hall high. Next thing you know, it's co-ed. Next thing you know, everybody in school wants to be involved with the volleyball team because the girls are down there. He said something at his Connecticut Hall of Fame banquet that has always stuck with me. The thing about being a coach is you're being judged by the performance of somebody else. So to be a great coach, you need to be able to motivate and teach your kids to do what you need them to do, what you're thinking, what you're seeing. And he was so good at that. When uh, I went into the field of coaching, the first thing that my dad said was, be yourself. He goes, don't try to be someone else. If you're not yourself, people are gonna see right through you. So be yourself and, and just any situation that comes up, just listen to your heart and, and go in that direction. Some of the things that we do as a team is we work on sports psychology, knowing that you can't worry about what's happened in the past. You can use it as a reflection tool, but you need to think about the next play. So that on the field, if things aren't going the way they want, they know it can change if all they worry about is now. Don't worry about later on from now. Don't worry about before. Worry about right now. Be in the moment. You have him. You have him. I think the sport of football teaches more about life than, than anything else in the development process. I'm not a teacher, I don't work in the school, I work in a real world corporate America. And football teaches you, I mean, there's guys in the locker room that may not even, may not like each other. They might not be friends, but they've got to get out in the football field and work well together. Um, you know, you, you're meeting people that you might not have ever met walking around the hallways of the school and you need to learn how to work well with them, how to learn from them. Um, you know, it, it just brings people together in a setting more like you would see in a work environment. You know, you don't always get to choose your coworkers. You don't always get to choose who your boss is gonna be. And so I think, for me, it's teaching those life lessons. Uh, we actually talk every day about the character and doing things right, whether it's on the field, off the field, at home. Um, and as a coach, you know you're gonna get called first if they're not doing something right. So you're always trying to preach the same thing, just do the right thing. And as a, as a head coach, uh, you should be the same way in the community. And when you're out in the community, make sure you're doing all the right things. And uh, I try my best to uphold that. So if there's one thing that we preach, it's you know lead by example. And I think if you met us, you know, on the field, off the field, that's a certain type of person that can only come out of a Hall football program that's just surrounded by such confidence that radiates from coaches and players. Hey, make a play right here. Let's go. Okay. Here we go. We made one. Let's make two. The mantra that I have every day is to get better every day. That's the, that's the deal. Get better in your life every day, whether it's on the practice field, whether it's at home or it's in the classroom, you're trying to get better every single day. And that's something that the kids will know, uh, hopefully through their whole life. Whatever it is you're doing, do the best you can, and uh, hopefully you're gonna get better at it. Frank Robinson as a player was an energetic, skinny, young quarterback and did an outstanding job of really moving the ball around in that wishbone. You can imagine that Frank would go home after practice and they would talk about football, watch football, watch film, and so it was almost like you had another coach on the field when Frank Robinson was here. Spend so much time with other people's kids, why can't you do it with your own? And so uh, I enjoy coaching my own. You know, you don't think of them when you're out there in a football situation. He's mine and he isn't, you know.
Whenever you're going for an undefeated season, I think that ends up being a little special the last game of the year. He started off 0-2, and uh, we knew we were better than that. Rattled off, what, six, seven, eight straight wins, right? Going into the uh, Hall Connor game. Meanwhile, they're undefeated, and they had a guy by the name of Albert Haynes. Albert Haynes was an All-American running back. And you don't get too many All-American running backs on your team. He ended up going to the University of uh, South Carolina, had a nice, nice career down there. And interestingly enough, Dave Gadu also played in that game, who's one of the assistant coaches, the offensive coordinator now at Hall High School. Playing on that team in 86 obviously was special. It's one of the ones that everybody talks about of, uh, of one of the best teams in the history of the school here. Of course, the obvious thing is we had a lot of good players, but I think, um, they played well together. Times or groups uh, just do that more naturally than others. You know, it was one of those things leading up to the week. We knew we were going to have a, a difficult challenge, and we were we were told that by our coaches, and and uh, and we believed them because we knew how Con how Connor was playing. They were loaded, and you know, quite frankly, yes, you are friendly with you know with these guys maybe off the field, but on the field. Uh -uh. You know, you're looking to kill them. They're grabbing at your fat. They're, you know, scratching you. They're, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on, right? So they are friends on the field. You know, you want to kill them, and they want to kill you. Well, at halftime, Hall was down 10 nothing, And again, Conrad has always played tough defense over there. And Conrad had pretty much shut down the Hall offense up through halftime. It was 10 nothing, And then that was the game. We're in the, I believe it was in late in the third period or early in the fourth period. One play turned the whole game around. Hall again couldn't move the ball. They punted, pretty good punt deep. And somehow the punt went off the back of a countered player. And Hall recovered the fumble. It's a decent punt. We'll come to the right side and bounce and bounce. A fumble of Stewart, and I believe it's a ball when it bounced, Bruno might have inadvertently touched the Connor player. We could have first down for Hall. Yes, three, we do. The next play, um, Albert Haynes went in for about a 30-yard touchdown. Albert Haynes comes over the line of scrimmage, had some open room, shook a tackle, and got into the end zone for the touchdown. And then Hall started running up, rolling after that. But that game really turned on that one play, and just about anyone who was there says that one play turned that game around. Haynes with the hand up, he gets around. He's down over across the midfield, and he's still going, and he may go. One man to beat the 20, the 15, the 10, the 5, and it is a touchdown! Touchdown! Holy mackerel! Haynes shook tackle after tackle after tackle, and has scored the touchdown. I didn't take my helmet off, I think, the whole ride home. Uh, you know, and I didn't talk to him. So it sucked, but it was a great experience. And, and once again, unfortunately, you know, left a bad taste in my mouth, you know? It, it was very special. And looking back to it, it's, uh, as we try to instill in a lot of our kids, is you may not really, you know, you might not remember what you did in math class your senior year. You're probably going to remember what happened, you know, in the football locker room and, and out in the field. So, Let's try to make it as special as we can, and we were lucky enough to have a very special year. I'll never forget how I felt after that game, and that motivated me for next year and our senior year, and I knew that we were just getting stronger and stronger, you know, and, and you know, we were getting bigger and bigger, so um, I just couldn't wait to, st you know, start playing, you know, again, senior year. You could tell at a very early age that uh, Robbie was an athlete. The uh, couch in the living room was a, uh, a trampoline. I played peewee football with Frankie. He was running the show back then. You know, you always knew that he was gonna be a quarterback and you always knew that he was gonna be a coach. I knew I wanted to be a, a football coach probably while I was in high school. I knew I wanted to teach as well. My mom was an elementary phys ed teacher and uh, my dad was a high school teacher. So I was attending Springfield College and I had an opportunity to have a student teaching opportunity in West Hartford. And I ended up with Coach Sosimo. And he allowed me to coach on the counter football staff. And that led into uh, just a great bond that I had with his family. They allowed me uh, the following year to stay in their house. I actually lived in their attic. 
he would come down in the morning and have breakfast with the kids. And, you know, every morning when the kids got up, and the kids were all young at this time, so there would be a constant battle. Whoever woke up first and they got downstairs, when the other sibling came in, and I'll say sibling because that's what it was like, they'd yell clicker. That meant they had the clicker for the day. Kind of looked at him as like my older brother. And I was in middle school at the time. Um, he was student teaching at Cedric, so he would give me a ride down to school. We would go to school together. Had a good arm on him. We would throw in the backyard all the time. Anytime we, we had a chance to talk, we'd probably talk football. Um, but it was definitely a situation where he and I got along very well and we were able to uh, connect. You know, he went to Hall, his dad coached him at Hall. I can't understand how he could come over to Conard and coach at Conard. I just, I never understood, I, I couldn't understand that. I'm coaching with someone who played for my dad. So that's kind of the angle I, I felt I was part of. I never really thought that, you know, fast forward all this time that we would be on opposite sidelines at the hall Connor game and coaching against each other. Every once in a while, I feel like you see people just truly doing what they were meant to do, what they were put on this planet to do, and that's how I feel about Coach Robbie. I feel like he just has coaching in his blood. I wasn't positive if I was going to be back at Hall, but I always knew that my roots were there because of my dad, and I always wanted to be there. And uh, when the opportunity arose, I, I took it. When Robbie came back to the program, uh, it, it kind of, again, brought life back to the program uh, in the fact that it, it was a, a person that was was known. As far as he knew, Hall was a Hall was a championship program, and the second he stepped into the program, he carried himself that way, and I think people followed suit. I mean, just, just think about it. I mean, you you get to take the job that your dad had forever, and I mean, when you think about this, um, I'm going to take over for my dad. For a son to be able to say that, that's that's phenomenal. It was. Um kind of a dream come true. Hey, we're going to individual D. Individual D, break it down. Just attack it. Good we don't figure it out. It's amazing if you do this every day. How oh, oh. good some of them can get out of it. Elbows. Elbows. <laughs> Coach Robinson is a character I wish everyone had the chance to meet. Attack, attack. He somehow manages to coach the game of football without swearing at all. Oh, Amari, you can't do that! He has this mystical power over his players. It's rumored that he's majored in psychology, so Arvin says he plays mind tricks on everybody, but it's just really a respect. Finish! Oh, thank you. There you go, not bad. And back. then when you rip, it should be a dip and rip. It's not just He taught me, personally, like, if you want something, you have to go out and get it. Like, if you want to be, if you want to start at quarterback, you have to lift, you have to throw it to the receiver, and you have to do everything correctly. Hands off if you're, he's moving. Good job, Tom. We go over the top. You need to put yourself around good people um, and make good decisions. He's, he's a great person. He makes great decisions. He's the best example I can give to my kids of the type of person that, that we want to be around. When a question needs to be answered and dues need to be paid, everyone's going to get the same treatment. And from that personality, he has definitely turned a few of us into some genuine young men he can make you feel guilty in the blink of an eye, just with a look, with a smile, with like a slight nod of the head. And, but it, that's, that's, that sort of power and that sort of respect he demands from his players is what makes us such a successful team. His sense of enlightenment, you know, you'll ask him a simple question and his responses will always surprise you. There's always something he wants to teach you. Going through four years of having this man has just been an experience, you know, nothing like I ever expected. And it's gonna be it's gonna be tough leaving him. He's such a great young man now. He's a, a wonderful father and a great role model. I mean, I couldn't be more proud of, of Frank Robinson for what he's done. Ready, hit, on your feet. Everybody get water, break. Okay, good work, here you go. We knew we were gonna be good. We knew we were loaded. I had my own personal motivation. I didn't, I didn't like how losing a hole. The previous year, we expected to win a state championship. We, we knew we had that talent. But if you go back to the 86 Hall Connor game, Connor played valiantly and could have won that game. They had a lot of underclassmen, like Brendan Sheehan, for example. And the next year, Connor ended up with the strong team. And that scenario has played out several times over the course of the rivalry. We knew, you know, 
At the end of the year, we were going to be facing a very talented and tough Hall team, you know? And, you know, because we've been butting heads with these kids since third grade. The 87 game was, uh, that was the ice bowl game. And that was also Frank's last game. And I will never forget that night watching the 11 o'clock news. And the weathermen said, bundle up. There is an Arctic cold wave that's going to be here when you walk out your door the next morning. So I'm thinking, how bad could it be, okay? I opened up the door the next morning, and it was one of the coldest I have ever been in my life. Um, the ground was so hard that you could barely get your footing. Uh, and I've still got a copy of a, of a game film that was on the, the TV version that um, you, the microphones were in and out because of how cold it was that day. We were undefeated. They might have had one loss. If they win, I believe they, we probably would have replayed in the state championship. Um, so obviously stakes were huge, as if it's not a huge game anyways. And, and then you throw in the, you know, added drama of a legendary coach, Frank Robinson's last game, right? The all-time series stands at a tight 14, 13, and 3. And as usual, this game means a league title. It's currently about 20 degrees with a wind chill factor of close to zero. And probably the, the fact that it's Frank Robinson's last game the Hall players certainly want to do everything they can to win the game for, for Frank. They call it the Frost Bowl or the Freeze Bowl. The fans left the game by, by halftime. If there were 30 people in the stands, it was ridiculous. At halftime, I was dragged into the press box with, by my mother, and she told me that we were going home because it was too cold. You know, thank God, if you're playing, you don't feel that because you're just so amped up, right? And. Uh, it was a hell of a game. I, you know, we went up and down the field. Uh, couldn't punch it in a couple times down low. Zurich takes it on his own 15. He's moving forward. He's got some room. He keeps, he's still on his feet. He breaks away. Zurich still going. He's continuing to go. Oh, he's con oh, he might go all the way. He did it. He scored a touchdown. And that puts Hall High right back into this game in a matter of seconds. It's on, you know, and we expected to win, but we knew it was not going to be an easy game, and it, 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 it was a bloodbath, you know. It was back and forth. We couldn't, we couldn't put them away, you know, and, you know, we were solid, you know, and we just, they knew what we were going to do, you know, we were going to run it, you know, like we did all year, you know, this is what we're going to do. Good luck stopping us. Big play now, first, third and goal, hand off to Sheehan. He's in for the score. They did a pretty good job of containing us, and you know, we couldn't put them away, and they nearly came back, but fortunately, the good guys won. It was so bitterly cold that the place was almost empty at the end of the game. It was a 16 to 12 game. Hall was a great team as well, and uh, you know, we were fortunate enough to, to finish the year 10 and 0 and go to the state playoffs against West Haven. Clock ticking down, five, four, three, two, one. Connor is going to the state championship game. And Hall's gathering around Coach Frank Robinson there. A uh, sad farewell for Coach Robinson. So it's his last game, and he comes up to me after, and he goes, Brennan, your father would be very, very proud of you. And I'm very proud of you. I'm like, Coach, this is your game, man. You know, and that just bespeaks to the guy. You know, he wasn't thinking about himself. You know, he's thinking about, always thinking about other people. You know, just, you know, just, uh, I'll never, never f forget that. Despite undefeated regular seasons, neither Hall nor Connor would win their respective state title games. Hall fell to West Haven 35-18 in 1986, while Connor lost to West Haven 7-zip in 1987. You know, football is an honors course. That's how I look at it. You know, everybody takes AP classes and honor courses when they want to go to college. And football is a life teaching event, in my opinion. Many people don't see it and they don't understand it. But athletics, and I think football the most, because you are 111th of a team when you're on the field. I don't care whether it's a kickoff team or return, offense, defense, some special team, it doesn't matter. You are 111th of a group. And if you do not do your job as 111th, 
then you let everybody else down. Go get him, go get him, go get him, Brian, under control, nice tap. Kick back, kick back, and ride him outside. Got it? You're gonna try to get him. You are gonna try to get him. Here we go. As far as work ethic is concerned, it's something that is, you know, important to me. I know in my classroom, I, I preach that as well. You know, being diligent and disciplined, self-disciplined for the most part. Whether it's the classroom, whether it's the football field, life in general, you, you do more than just endure. You have to work at it, whether it be relationships, whether it be parenting. I mean, football is, for me, a metaphor for all those things. Let's get this thing done here. Let's go, boys. Let's go, let's go, Temple, boys. Offense on three. Let's go. One, two, three. Offense. Let's go. the boundary stop. When they leave Connor, they're going to have to be able to work successfully within a group of other people to get their job done, to make money, to put food on the table for their families. And this game teaches them those values. This game teaches them how to be a good team player. And I think that's the most benefit that they receive by playing this game because they can't do it by themselves. And just like life, you're going to have a partner, you're going to have a family, you're gonna have people that depend on you, and they and you have to be held accountable by your actions. Break down, break down, break down, get your head on it, good job. Go and reach, run through, go. Fine, but double them first back off the ball. If you double them off back off the ball, you'll drive them right into the back, yeah. right? That makes it even better. Then you just slide up easy. Your question about how does football relate to life? Uh, football's not life but football is the door to open up what you can do best in your life if you so use the skills of being a team player. All right, here we go, follow me, ready? Come on in, come on in, come on in, come on in, let's go, 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 I remember when we were at Fern Park and Matt was one of the little kids in the waiting pool. And all the other parents were like, oh, isn't this nice? Your kid's a little splashing around and this and that. And Rob is to Matt, kick those legs, Matt, kick those legs. I remember my sister Barbara saying, you know something, Steve? Matt's going to grow up a little different than most kids in this town. Matt and I would watch film. He'd sit on my lap and I'd hold him. We'd be in the cellar. He says to me, Dad, he goes, aren't the linebackers supposed to go with the guards on uh, defense? I go, yes, Matt, they are. He goes, well, the guard is pulling and your linebacker is not going with them. I know a lot of people always looked at me with a, a microscope, but I looked at it as a challenge. I looked at it as an opportunity for me to kind of uh, become my own person. The thing that, that caught me most of all is that he received no different treatment than anybody else on our football team. He spoke to his father the same way that all of us did. Nothing but respect. There was never any dis, you know, talk back like you would as any son would do with their father. My father never ever once uh, told me how to act. He never once said to me, these are the expectations of you because of our last name in town or because I'm the head football coach. It was just uh, constant leadership just by the way that he carried himself and the way he acted as opposed to him telling me how to do things. Just fun to watch the dynamic between Matt and his dad when, uh, when Matt was a player. There was a lot of intensity going around here at that time, you could say. You know, ha having my father as a coach and literally bring the game back to my house with me and having the opportunity to watch the film and sit down and, and watch what he was watching and learn how he was studying the film helped me as a quarterback, and I relished it. I relished it the moment to watch film with him and get a chance to you know, see what he wanted to do for a game plan and get a chance to see what he wanted to do uh, with our offense you know, that week. To be able to coach him was probably the greatest experience of my life um, as far as being a coach. Coaching at UConn was an unbelievable experience. That's where I really started to learn the game. Having the opportunity to go on the run that we did towards the end of the year, and then there we are sitting uh, in the locker room after the game, and the Fiesta Bowl representatives are there, and the Orange Bowl representatives are there, and they basically say to us, guys, you're gonna be at one of our bowl games, we'll find out tomorrow. And then having the opportunity to go out to the Fiesta Bowl and play Oklahoma was something that 
you know, I'll never forget. Leaving UConn was, was obviously uh, an interesting decision, but it was something that I knew that I always wanted to do. It was just a matter of when the time was right. New coach C here, it's kind of brought some new life to the, the team. He's worked with UConn, he's worked at higher levels, and now he's bringing it down to Connor. It's just awesome, the fact that he can help us out. He expects a whole level of intensity, just like he experienced when he was here. He brings something new, and especially coming down for a D1 school like UConn, he has a lot to um, offer. The passion and the work ethic and the commitment level that it takes to win at the college level, you know, preparing your mind as well as your body throughout the course of the week is something that I'm trying to, th those are the messages that I'm trying to send to the players on a daily basis. You know, what we see now with them coaching side by side on the offense is, is pretty cool because, you know, you definitely have an individual who's from one generation but he's able to work with someone who's from a different generation and vice versa. I think Matt, he knows what it takes to, to have that Connor, you know, tough football mindset. He goes to college and he becomes a coach and uh, now he becomes like your peer, you know, and now I'm not his equal. <laughs> he's above me because he's that much more intelligent about what's going on in the game of football. So for me to be under his tutelage at this time and learning from him is, is the most exciting phase of my life. And now to have the opportunity to go through an entire season with him as a coach has been something that has been so special to me. I think it's awesome. I mean, it, it's, it's cool. I stand out there and I watch the two of them and I just go, what an opportunity to watch the two of them be together that most father and sons can't do. For the first time, you know, Connor and Hall will play under lights on a Friday night, you know, steering away from a traditional 1.30 Saturday afternoon game. So that alone adds another chapter in the rivalry. I've talked to many, many ex-players going back to the 60s, 70s. Every single one of them thinks it is wonderful. And those are the guys who really made the tradition what it is. Well, this is getting into an area where I and probably the most unpopular retired coach. I don't believe in night football. I grew up with it uh, in high school, prep school, college. It was a Saturday experience. The question to play Hall Connor under the lights was very controversial, and it even went as deep as my family arguing with each other. The opportunity that comes with playing a Hall Connor game under the lights, I think, outweighs any sort of, you know, pain in losing the tradition. I'm glad I've turned my feelings on the situation around because I don't think there's any other way I would have wanted this season to end than facing our crosstown rivals under those lights. There's a lot of traditionalists out there, and, and I, I'm one of them. I, I've always looked at the Hall Connor game as, as being a Saturday afternoon game before Thanksgiving. But I am for the night game. I'm really looking forward to having the opportunity to play uh, Hall at night. It'll add to the mystique of the game, I think, on a Friday night. So I think it's going to be something that's going to be really great and special. The day before the game is mainly a walkthrough, particularly at the end of a long season. One Go, final opportunity on. to check the Go. details. And while the atmosphere is light, the focus remains intense. After practice, the Conard Varsity cheers on the JV, a tight win and hopefully an omen. They wait for nightfall in one of the football team's most sacred traditions, the burial ground. There's no passage through our burial ground. And uh, the, the catch-22 is there's no other way to get to the field but through our burial ground. So we're going to give them heck. You know, we're going to give them all we can give them if they go through our burial ground. So we have a bonfire, and the kids would talk about whatever they want to talk about. And uh, it was eye-opening to listen to some of the kids speak about it what they thought was important. And, uh, some of them had an ax to grind, so they buried it there. And some of them uh, had something they wanted to say to the team and their teammates. So it's been a, 
a really great tradition as far as listening to young people express themselves in a very, very uh, serious fashion. When we beat Paul 10 years in a row, I always wore a blue blazer to the game. It had all kinds of stuff that people gave me. Attitude pig, chief the head, a lot of like, different things that people admit and stuff like that. So I it was cursed, so I burned it. Because we have to, after 10 years, we lost. That blue blazer, all my stuff was in it. You see, it was so good. When you go up to speak, do it well. Where are we going first? Go right ahead. I'll go. I've been hearing from a lot of people that people have asked me what I think about the last game and they were going to be saying our last goodbyes. And I don't consider it goodbye, but it's a goodbye. I just, so that's why I'm here. The one thing I'm here to leave for Connor, to leave my mark on Connor football, and take home what I'm going to remember. Connor football forever. I do f feel like when I was playing, we started to develop belief in each other that when it came to the Conard Hall game, we were gonna win that game, as though we were maybe the older brother and we had gotten the better of our younger brother. I remember one of our teammates having a dream that we lost the game. <laughs> and we were all kind of like, whoa, like, hey, wait a minute here. Uh, so we were doing everything in our power. So it was almost like when the game was over, it was almost like, weight off our shoulders that we weren't the team that had lost the streak as opposed to, yeah, we just beat Hall again. That was pretty much it because everything hung over your head was it was eight years, nine years in a row, ten years in a row. I think the kids thought more about it than we did. And the newspapers made a big deal about that, and we never made a big deal about it. You know, sometimes we got a lucky break. I know there were a couple 6-0 games or even a 7-6 game in there that, you know, it could have gone either way. I think the 93 game, we missed a field goal at the end of the game that could have won it. Quarterback got right to the middle of the field, everything was perfect, and I don't know what happened except that the final result was the field goal was a little bit wide and, and kind of hung on to win 7-6. Especially with the streak then being at 10 years and the decade of dominance, that phrase being thrown around, by this point, any alumni or any guys you talk to that know you're about to play in the game are just almost begging you to win. You know, so much pressure has been built up and so much anxiety from losing year after year that you get guys saying, can, can you guys please just win? Can you please just win this year? My father clearly had a sense that this was gonna be such an important moment in my life that I was gonna wanna remember it forever. Going into my senior year, we had won uh, against Hall 10 years in a row. I think we were favored to, to beat Hall, and it ended up being just this horrific, muddy, freezing cold, rainy day. It was a bad day. It was raining, and I felt whoever got up early um, was going to have the, the upper hand. I do remember the first pass play we called. I threw an interception, bounced up in the air. John O'Brien got his hands on it. We scored our first touchdown on an option play to the right. Willie Cardona took the ball in, and I just remember feeling this sense, collective sense on the sideline, like this, this is the year. This is the year we can do this. And I remember the second touchdown in the second half was a, just an unbelievable play call by Coach Robinson. I remember walking in the huddle thinking, this play is not gonna work. This is gonna get stuffed. I don't understand why we're not throwing the ball. And I remember handing the ball off to Willie, watching him run through the, through the center untouched. And I have never doubted Coach Robinson again for the rest of my life. And I'll still remember the huddle as the teams came up to at the end of the third period. And at this time, we were ahead uh, 14 to nothing. And um, we had the ball about to 30. And we're like, hey, listen, we score one more. It's going to be tough with the field conditions. And we're like, Greg Stiles, like, we're throwing it. I remember almost blindly throwing it up to Mike Pilo, thinking that's where he's supposed to be. Um, 
and then seeing him come down with it, it was a beautiful diving catch. That was the most magical moment of my athletic career, maybe. When Mike came down with that pass, sliding in the end zone, and that was, at that point, it was like, we're gonna win this game. There's no way we're not winning this game. As far as I, I was concerned, it was a bright, sunny day when that game was over. 10 years had finally, finally ended. You know those games where you just don't wanna shower? You just don't wanna shower afterwards. You just wanna keep that mud on you forever. And it was, that was the kind of game I remember driving home, covered in mud, just wanting to kind of wear that mud around for a couple weeks. It was obviously a really difficult game to go through. I actually dislocated my shoulder in the third quarter of the game. I uh, didn't finish the game, I had to go to the hospital. So while that was important, there's other things you take away from being a part of the program than either winning or losing that game. I never ever gave him grief because I knew how hard he tried and how hard he played. And he, like I, took all those principles and, and you know, brought them into, brought them on the athletic field and brought them, brought them into everyday life. So he was, uh, his intensity and, and, and ability to play, you know, far exceeded what his, I hate to say it, but what his body could handle. Quote from the, uh, the Hartford Current that says, the exhilaration of long-suffering Hall fans, most of whom stormed the field after the game, was summed up by, by Von Meyerhauser. This is the greatest feeling I've ever had, said Von Meyerhauser, a senior. I can't explain it. This is for all the seniors and all the seniors before us who never beat Connard. I don't even know what to say. And I still don't really know what to say. We didn't just win the game for ourselves. We won the game for, like I said, all those guys who you start coming up to you weeks prior to the game said, please, can you just please end this streak? Can you get this monkey off our back? From one tradition to another, the pre-game dinner. For Hall, it takes place at the school cafeteria. Many of the players spent the afternoon getting a unique haircut for the occasion. A good time for players, coaches, and parents alike. We're teaming, and we share. <laughs> right. The Connor players gather at the home of Captain Caleb La Rosa for dinner. The boys from the south side of town have also elected to shave their heads, but the job is hardly professional. Greg Kramus shaves the head of his son, Captain Chris Kramus, a proud moment for the former chieftain lineman, class of 94. It is a raucous celebration of another successful season, one last gathering before the final battle on the gridiron. It's the best rivalry in the state. It is the best rivalry in the state. All year long, all throughout the entire fall sports season, everything builds up to the football game. You're friends off the football field, but once you're on the football field, there's just an intensity. It's, in, it's insane. I get my uncles and I have friends who have gone through the program talking about this grueling game that comes up, crosstown rivals battling each other in the dirt and the mud seeing who's the better side of town. And then when we're out there on that field, it's a whole different story. It's like we're not friends anymore, we're enemies. We both go to two different schools, and it's just about who wants it more, who's hungry, and who wants to win. Well, because I have parents from both sides of, of Conard and Hull, it's, uh, it's unique. It's, it's like a kind of a rivalry in my house. My dad talks about lots of his games, but he does like to go back to the hall Conard game. It's like, it's like the game you're going to remember the rest of your life. Two families get to come together and the town gets to watch as, you know, this young generation fights each other on the gridiron. If you win the Hall Connard game, that's all that matters. You could lose all your games in your high school career, but if you beat Connard your senior year, you had a good high school career. Thank you. 
with his parents, Kevin and Ricardo Brown. 57th all-time renewal. Connor has won 32 times. Hall 21. There have been three ties. Whereas Hall has won the last two in the series, and they're trying to make it three in a row tonight and qualify for those state playoffs. Oh, oh. I got Walter La Rosa approaches the ball, puts the toe into it, we're underway. Anyatsky belts out an audible as he lines up in that shotgun formation. Takes the snap, play action fake, back to pass, pump fakes, throws it deep down the right side, has Kelly open, he's got it! 25, 20, 15, 10, 5, touchdown! Hall right off the bat on the first play! We have a, um, an opportunity for parents to the first play of the Hall Connor game. This particular season, Neil Kelly's parents were the ones who had that opportunity. You know, we were fortunate enough to have it be uh, not only just a, a great play call, but to start off with a touchdown. Here's a handoff this time as they go to a bell to the far side. Ball is loose, picked up by the Chieftains, and they've recovered the fumble and return it out across the 45-yard line. So if you're a big underdog, that's how you stay in ball games. You force those turnovers. Here's a handoff, Bellamy straight ahead to the 10, to the 5, and he runs into the end zone. Touchdown, Hall. 13-0, pending the extra points. Let's get it, boys. Let's get it. Let's get it. Let's kick off, brother. Run with it, run with it, run with it, run with it, run with it. Run with it. Pick it. Nice job, bro. Look like you're going in the B gap, and then head on into the A, and get there and rip through, and get to this quarterback. And they send a man in motion, play action, fake, straight drop. They look to set up the screen. It's complete near side of the field. Here's Bell, 40, 45, 50, in the counter territory, cuts back at the 40, and he's gonna be brought down at the 35-yard line. Anyatsky rolls to his left, throws on the run. That's intercepted by the Chieftains. Down the far sideline, picked off and out of bounds at their own 43-yard line. So the Hall Warriors score on their first play from scrimmage in the first quarter. They add a touchdown in the second, and your score at halftime is Hall 14 and Connor nothing. On this night, Connor recognizes the 1972 team. Members of the team gather on the 50-yard line to welcome back their old coach, Bob McKee. A moving ceremony for players and fans alike, honoring an incredible era in this town's football history. Going undefeated was really special. Um, I don't think at the moment when it happens, you um, grasp the full meaning of it. We came into school um, the fourth game of the year, and each of us had a piece of tape across the crown of our helmet that had now on it with one, two, and three, and none of us knew what it was. And um, we went over to Manchester, we played an undefeated Manchester team, and, and we, we beat them in the final seconds of the game. And uh, when, <clears throat> when we got back on the bus, Coach McKee um, grabbed the helmet, and he told us now meant no opponents win. And, and he said, but there's something a little more special about it. And uh, he took a helmet and he held it up to the bus rearview mirror. And the now spelled one. So he told us that, you know, when you uh, go back to the school 
and you walk in and you look in the mirror and you have your helmet on, you're gonna know you won. As they built up to the 72 season, Hall was kind of building up to the mid 70s where they had very, very good teams. And then in 75, Hall ran the table and won 10 and 0. And as a matter of fact, that was kind of the foundation of the state playoffs that we have today. Hall was the best team upstate. Staples was the best team downstate. And they did not have the state playoffs back then. And the coaches and principals decided that Hall and Staples would play the following Saturday after the hall Connor game to, to kind of determine who the best team in the state was. And somewhere along the line, someone came in and said that, that was, they could not do that. So they did it, and the next year the state playoffs came in so that that would never happen again. But that being said, when Conard was in 72, was undefeated, Hall gave him a great game that last game. Hall played them very, very tough. And in 75, when Hall had that great team, Conard played them very tough. So it's always been a tough game. And no matter who's the favorite in this game, you can really throw the records out. Our defense is playing on their head. They are standing on their head to give us the ball back and make sure we got the ball in good field position. We've got to hold up our end, and we've got to hold the rope for the defense that's playing their ass off. All right, we're doing a great job, a great job on 85 and 12. Okay, five's had a couple of balls caught. Listen, you put fast guys on five. If you and, and, and Mo, take it personal right now. Take it a little personal. Like, hmm, they're throwing the ball to five, that's on me. Do you hear it? Do you hear it? It's the Chieftains coming. Do you hear it now? Can you really hear it? Big time! Let's go get it, Lord! Let's go! Can you hear it? Now believe it! Let's go! Make it happen for us! Make it happen for us! We can do it! Dear Lord, you can do it! Angled kick, far side, third quarter underway. On the return at the 25, 30, crossing the 35. Ball is loose, it's fumbled. It's on the turf. Hall says they have it. From the 19, fourth of a dozen, takes a snap, throws it, and it's incomplete. And they're going to turn it over on downs. Now a direct handoff goes to Bellamy this time. The direct snap goes to the far side, on his feet inside the 15, inside the 10, and is finally ridden down. Trying to score a touchdown for the third quarter in a row. Handoff to Bellamy, straight ahead, powers his way into the end zone. Touchdown, Hall. First down and 10, play action fake. Hanyatsky throws to his right. It's complete, 35-40. This is power far side, Connor territory. He's gonna go. 30, 20, 15, 10, five, touchdown. Rob Hara. Countered on offense, first down, big running play, crossing the 30, 35, here's Johnson still on his feet, at the 40, at the 45, 50, into Hall territory, and finally ripped out of bounds near sideline. Takes the snap, back to pass, throws towards the end zone, into the end zone, touchdown, Connor. Final score here tonight of the 57th renewal between Hall and Connard. Hall 35, Connard 7.
Okay, so you're beating us, and you beat us this time. So we have to live with that fact. But what that should do is you start to start to burn a fire in you. If you guys are leaving, that fire should burn you to try to do something better with your lives and continue to work forward to be better in everything that you do. We collectively lost the game, all of us. It wasn't because we didn't try, because we did try. But today they were better than we were. All right, buddy, George. Good luck to you, friend. All right. Nearly 30 years after Coach C took over at Connor, losing to Hall doesn't get any easier. But for this man, football is about so much more than wins and losses. I met him at the old friendlies at Bridal Path, hanging out on a Friday night, and he had his yellow Corvette. And I, <laughs> I went up to him and I asked him if he'd take me for a ride. And he said, yeah. And I said, I have bubble gum. And he said, okay, I'll take a piece of bubble gum. He took me for a ride, and that's when he asked me who I, who I was, what was my last name. And I told him, and I had the fastest ride back to Bridal Path ever, because he found out that I was Coach McKee's daughter, and he was like, forget it. I love him, man. He's, he's crazy. Passionate, loyal, father figure, just a wonderful man, um, a very intense man, one that you do not want to cross, just a wonderful guy, great athlete, great family man. This was a family, you know, and he was the leader of our family. And when you came into Conard High School as a Connor Chieftain football player, you soon realize the level of discipline, commitment, hard work, effort, and intensity that was required to kind of rise the ladder and become a true Connor Chieftain. And he instilled that so thoroughly and deeply within his players that his players, they were kind of an extension of Coach C. You have to have accountability, you have to be disciplined. You have to have a philosophy you believe in and stick to it. And that's one of the things that I've carried on in my coaching career, the way he runs his team and does not individualize awards, but makes it more of a team award, keeps things really um, about the team and about the group and never about the individual. One of his strongest qualities was he just had this incredible natural intensity, and it was inspiring. As a player, you wanted to go out there and you wanted to lay it all on the line, not only for your teammates, but for your coaches and especially your head coach. He was the type of guy who you wanted to lay down and die for. And every player on our team, how do I best say this, had an attitude and had a persistence and had a toughness about them. People didn't want to come play con because it was going to be a physical war. He's somebody that when I got in trouble was always one of the first ones there. Um, not to get me out of it, but to make sure I got the discipline I deserved for what I did. Whether it was in school or even my mom calling him sometimes from the house to get him involved in some family matters to make sure that I was taken care of because she knew the one person I respected and would listen to was him. I'm always trying to make the young man understand, listen, do you want me to care about you? And one of the most famous stories that I ever have is I'm talking to this kid about, do you want me to care about you or not? And the kid goes, coach, could you care a little less? You know, he was a person that impacted my life uh, and changed my life for the better. And still to this day, the things that he taught me, the base discipline, integrity, respecting yourself and others around you, those are, those are things that transcend into everyday life. It's just, it's hard for me to envision myself away from Conard football, away from Conard High School. It's what I know, it's what I've done all my life to be a teacher and coach at, 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 in West Hartford. And for me to say, okay, um, it's time for me to go, that, that's, that's hard for me to say, okay, I'm ready to retire. When I was applying to law school, I wrote an essay about Coach C and the impact that he had on me as a person. He taught us discipline, focus, accountability, honesty and integrity, especially when facing adversity and how to rise above adversity and to become stronger, not only as a person, but as a unit and as a team, as a program. Uh, the commitment that it takes to not only be the best player that you can be, but the best teammate you can be, the best student, the best son, the best ultimately father, husband, whatever avenue you pursued as a profession to never settle for something less than, than the absolute best from yourself. When I was a, a junior here at Conard, uh, my brother Luke was a senior, and 
our father passed away suddenly and um, next morning, literally the first person that came to, the, to my mom's house was Coach C. And he just walked right in and he hugged us, each and every one of us, my mother, my brothers, and just said, if there's anything I could ever do or you ever need, uh, just let me know. And that was, that, that is the kind of man that he, he was. And the second person I saw that day was his daughter, Bree, who skipped school to come over and, and, and see how we were all doing. So this is a family of, of wonderful people whom I love and respect, and they hold a very special place in my heart. I, uh, it's funny, today I, on the way home from church, I was listening to Toby Keith sing about uh, it's time for you to, to live your life with the one you love. And uh, it's, it's, it is time for me to live my life with Debbie. Um, I, I can't even uh, express how much that woman has uh, given up in her life uh, for me. Um, to allow me to teach and coach. The 2013 game was Coach C's last as head coach at Carn. During the winter, his son Matt was named his successor. His father will remain on the staff and coach the freshman team. The whole Warriors season came to an end in the state quarterfinals, once again versus West Haven. The town's quest for an elusive state title will have to wait another year. The rivalry rolls on, 57 years and counting. Hall and Connor, the Robinsons and the Sersosimos, ready for the next season and the next generation. You know, let's look at it this way. You guys carried me all through my youth. <laughs> you, know, you carried me through your high school years. You carried me when you were coaching the whole time. Give me a break. <laughs> you know, I can't take much credit for anything, really. I can just take credit for being around great people. That's you know, this is really a, a uniqueness uh, in the life of high school football. Oh, it, is. Yes. it is. And we went back to what I college folks to yep. bring in, keep our things going. <laughs> we'll, we'll see how that works out. <laughs> to be determined. Oh, no, that's right. Well, we'll see. We'll definitely you know, see. It is, I think it's a wonderful experience. Mm -hmm. And I feel happy that we did it together. Oh, yeah. Yeah, all all we started, started, started all of it. Yeah. 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 Every day of the year, we're good friends, except one day we're kind of you know, just uh, opponents. Yeah. We went to all the clinics together and we went all over the place. Well, the, the problem is that it started with your siring. You're a coach. I had to make sure I found somebody to marry my daughter. Yeah. <laughs> you found the right guy. Right. <laughs> I, I don't know. There's a lot of times she goes, geez, I wonder if I did the right thing with that one. <laughs> I feel so proud and happy. This is so unique for us. Is it? Yeah. I mean, what? <laughs> <laughs> you know, 